But today we're going to be talking about conflict. If you've been in a relationship, even a friendship, but if you've been in a relationship, a marriage, for any amount of time, you will know that eventually conflict will happen. You have what's called your honeymoon phase, right? We get along with everything. We don't agree, you know, we don't disagree with anything, and love is great, and then life slaps you in the face once you find out that they do stuff that you absolutely can't stand. (laughs) You know what I mean? I mean, people have argued over things ranging from toilet paper to how you fold your towels. I remember Angel and I, I couldn't stand it. She folded her towels like a big square. I'm like, who does this? Are you a savage? (laughs) I'm just kidding. It's bad, but yeah, it's true. So I like, I fold mine, you know, into like a little small square rectangle. I fold it three times and, and then actually she started getting on me because I was like getting lazy and I just folded my towels like a square. Angel has wonderful, uh, wonderful parents. They'll come up and they'll watch Piper and they'll fold, they'll fold our laundry and help us out because they're great and it's awesome. And uh, they fold it into big squares and I'm too afraid to say anything. They're not here this weekend. Uh, because, you know, they're helping me out. But it does. It kind of drives me a little nuts. And Angel and I, we've gotten arguments, and you guys know this, right? If you've been married for any amount of time, you get in arguments over some of the dumbest things ever. And sometimes it's the really, really dumb things that turn into really, 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 really big arguments. I remember Angel and I just even recently. So Angel's parents live in Winchester, Virginia. And so we'll take Route 70. But before we get to Route 70, there are two routes that basically they, they kind of run parallel. There's Route 97 and Route 27 in Mount Airy. And so what I like to do is I think, what is the shortest way to get there, right? The shortest way to get there. And so that's to take Route 97. Well, the problem with Route 97, almost every single time it seems that Angel was with me, when she's with me, I don't know why God lets this happen, but we will get stuck behind a school bus or somebody who's driving like 20 miles an hour. It drives me nuts. I mean, it's just crazy. So she wants me to take this alternative route because that's her route that she likes to choose, right? It's faster. Well, anyways, long story short, so we're in this argument, you know, we're on the ride home, and she, you know, she wants me to take Route 27, and I've been taking Route 27, but I took the other route just to spite her. So she's like, why did you take this route? Lo and behold, it's like God's punishing me. I get stuck behind this Winnebago and this slow cement truck, and it was like God had it all lined up because Rick was going to have his proud moment. And we got into an argument about it. And there are countless other things that we've gotten into arguments about. And sometimes you fight over things that are really stupid, and you look back and you're like, wow, that was really, really petty. Did it really have to escalate to this? You guys know exactly what I'm talking about. Other times, you do get in arguments over really big stuff. And conflict happens because you're two different individuals coming from two different backgrounds, and you're trying to have a relationship where the Bible says the two, we read this last week, shall become one flesh. I was reading a a Yahoo article, and there's a couple, really high-profile couple out there, Jenna and Channing Tatum. Some people say me and Channing are like twins, and... uh, is there a reason why you all are laughing? Gosh, I'm going to have to call him up be like, look, man, church was saying you don't look as good as I do. That's even worse. I'm sorry. I don't know why I do that. It's not even in my notes. But anyways, so, so they ask Jenna, you know, because they, they seem like the perfect couple, right? So they ask her about her relationship with Channing, and they just seem like everything works. And she responded to the article. She says, when people say you guys have such a perfect life, I want to scream and tell them no one is perfect. But I think a couple needs to be conscious and want to work and be willing to look at the parts that you need to work on. And she continues. She says this, both of us have had, are pretty aware and we're willing to do that. And we've always had the same values, but we're not perfect. Are you kidding? We fight like other couples. We disagree about things. We've had days where we really don't like each other. I mean, there are some days you feel like you're at war instead of in love. And so conflict can happen. And when conflict happens, we feel broken and disconnected and disrespected. And if we're not careful, we will be at war with each other rather than loving one another, as the Bible tells us. And so if I could have you walk away with something this morning, it would be simply this. In your relationships, God wants you to seek peace and pursue it. Seek peace and pursue it. Be at peace with each other. 
And so if we're going to be at peace with one another, the first thing that we have to do is we've got to identify the conflict. And, and here's the main issue. The primary reason why we have conflict is because we are easily seeing, we easily see what is done to us rather than seeing what we are doing to our mate or to the other person. And so when a husband uh, is unloving towards the wife, the wife will respond typically, and these are general truths, okay? This isn't true for every scenario or every case, but the wife will typically respond with a verbal assault. She will feel attacked, and she will think, this is so wrong. How can he treat me like this? How can he be so insensitive? Am I last on his priority list? This is so unloving. He doesn't care about me. I would never treat him this way. What a horrible husband. And wives will typically respond with the words. And once they can just get it out and tell you how they feel, ah, I feel better. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 19, it instructs husbands, husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. This word harsh carries the idea of bitterness. It's like, have you ever eaten something that is just so bitter, it's repulsive? You can't even, you can't even eat it. You can't even swallow it. You just spit it out. That's, that's the idea of harshness. It's to be fed up, to be done, to cut them off. It's what I call the stone wall tactic right? You just stonewall. I'm done. I'm not talking to you. I don't want anything to do with you. Leave me alone. That's typically how men will respond to their wives. But we can't do that. As husbands, we can't respond to conflict that way. But if husbands can be unloving, we talked about this last week, wives can be disrespectful. And typically, as I said, when a husband feels disrespected, he will withdraw rather than pursue. And wives will pursue their husbands. I mean, ladies, I mean, you probably know this. When your husband hurts you, I mean, you are chasing him down. You want to talk it out. You want to get this over with. And you want to be back together. And your husband wants absolutely nothing to do with you in that heated moment. He's like, leave me alone. I need my space. Let me chill out. And then eventually, once he thinks it through, he'll probably come back. Like I said, these these are general teachings that can be true for you. but, uh, But we need to be aware of this. We need to identify this conflict. And so the husband will think something along these lines. She is so disrespectful to me. Why can't she just give me some space, especially after everything that she said to me? Proverbs chapter 25 verse 24 says this, It is better to live in the corner of a roof than in a house shared with a contentious woman. Always contending every point, arguing, and you just feel disrespected. I've heard wives say this, I love my husband, but I don't respect him. This is equally as hurtful, ladies, if your husband were to say, I respect my wife, but I do not love her. Think about how you would feel, wives, if your husband said that to you. You'd be crushed. You can't think, how is that even possible? Love and respect, it's different for a man and for a woman, and we have to look at it that way. Professor Gottman, uh, he has a doctorate's degree in psychology. He says this. He says, these types of interactions, these conflicting inter- interactions, can produce a vicious cycle, especially in marriage with high levels of conflict. The more wives complain and criticize, the more husbands withdraw and stonewall. And the more husbands withdraw and stonewall, the more wives complain and criticize. And he actually goes on to say this, that if a wife becomes belligerent and contemptuous, and a husband becomes harsh and unloving and detached, the marriage is in serious danger and most likely will end in divorce. And so the wife is tragically affected. She's, she's shocked to the heart, and the husband is infuriated in anger, and the both suddenly withdraw from each other, and Satan gets a foothold, and he divides the marriage. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 8, gives us the answer. How do, we, how do we deal with this conflict after we identify it? We need to think about it. It says, in, in applying this biblical principle to marriage, it says, the wise person will give thought to their ways. And so that's the next point that I'd like to share with you, is that we can't just identify the source of the conflict. When we're in the conflict, even after the conflict, we need to think about it. And so wives, when you feel unloved, in that moment, every ounce of your body and your heart and your mind wants to lash out and respond, and you you want your husband to hurt and feel the pain that you feel. But in that moment, we want you to think, is my husband acting unloving because I've been disrespectful? I really don't feel loved right now. And so maybe you even ask your husband this. Husband, have I disrespected you because I really feel unloved in this moment? It gives you the opportunity to talk about it. Open up those channels of conflict and deal with the resolution. 
And it's the same thing with the husbands. Husbands, when you feel hurt and offended by your wife and disrespected, instead of withdrawing or acting harshly or lashing out in anger uh, and beating her down, you should ask yourself this and think, is my wife acting disrespectful because I've been unloving? And even tell her, honey, I don't feel very respected right now. Have I done something that's caused you to feel unloved? No name calling, no lashing out, no withdrawing. And these types of things should absolutely be unacceptable in the Christian home. This is not not what God is calling us to do. We should not behave like that. And so our biggest enemy is simply this. It is our failure to follow the faith. We're afraid. We're scared. We plainly see what the Bible teaches. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Wives, respect your husbands. But in that moment, we are afraid that if we follow God on this principle, we'll be taken advantage of. Our our spouse will get away with it. They'll think that they can do it again. And so we become in control. We think that we know what's best. And so we act according to our own wisdom rather than according to the wisdom of God. But we only make things worse. Ultimately, our worst enemy is our own faithlessness. And so this is really difficult because many of you know this, your reactions can become second nature. I mean, you don't even think for a moment, have I really disrespected my husband or have I really been unloving to my wife? And so in that moment of heated conflict, your nature happens, your second nature, and you respond the way you have always responded. Maybe you've been raised in a home where you yell and you scream and you fight, and so that's what you do, that's your nature. Maybe you've been raised in a home where you withdraw and you avoid and you just hope everything settles and that's your nature. But we need to follow the plan of God. And so our reactions to our spouses can become second nature, but we need to have a renewed nature and the image of Jesus. And this really flows through for all of our relationships, not just a a married couple, right? This type of stuff will come out in your working relationships and your friendships. I mean, it it will flow through everywhere. And so we need men who are honorable and who love and who are compassionate. And we need women who are respectful and who are generous and kind. And so what do we do? We identify the conflict. We know that it's something that needs to be dealt with. And so here's the third point. And this is where we're going to get into our passage of scripture this morning in 1 Peter chapter 3. We need to resolve it. I was actually raised in a home where you didn't deal with a conflict. You just withdrew right? There was no confrontation. You just kind of hoped that the the storm blew over, so to speak, and then you'd come back together acting like nothing ever happened, and things would fester. And I had an explosive personality um, uh, eventually. I would implode. I would digest it. I would eat it. I would swallow it. I mean, I would just build it up, and then the smallest thing would happen, typically, and then I would explode over it because I didn't know how to communicate and how to deal with my conflict. And so if I can give you any encouragement this morning, this passage of scripture is applied to the church, but wow, it is one of the greatest passages of scripture that you can apply to yourself if you're going to be in a relationship. And so turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 8 and 11. Now if you want to today, Read the first seven verses of 1 Peter chapter 3, and he actually talks about the relationship between a husband and a wife, and it's really, really good stuff. But we're going to pick up in verse 8. So after he addresses husbands and wives, he says, Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tenderhearted. Be courteous. Can't lose our manners. Not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, or that another word would be insult for insult. But on the contrary, bless, knowing that you were called to this so that you may inherit a blessing, he says. And then he quotes some Old Testament scripture here. He says, for he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And so he jam-packs these passages of Scripture right here, these verses, this passage of Scripture, with some really good information. So if you're not married, this is something that you can apply to yourself. And if you practice these biblical principles, you will be blessed. You will inherit the blessing of God. And so look at the first thing that he says here. First of all, he says, I want you to be like-minded. Another word for this is to unify. It literally means to share the same perspective. The Bible does teach when it comes to marriage, Christians should not be unequally yoked. When you have two different people 
with two different backgrounds and two different worldviews, confrontation is inevitable. And so obviously, if you can find someone that is compatible like you, that shares the same values and the same worldview, especially when it comes to your belief in Jesus, you can accomplish the same purpose. You can be more like-minded and unified. And so that's what the Bible wants us to have. In other words, it says don't beat each other up, right? And we can do that, especially when things get heated. We can tear each other down and beat each other up with harsh words. Look at what Proverbs 15 verse 18 says. A hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger quiets contention. We're no longer divided against each other and hurting one another, but we're patient. We're like-minded. We're unified. The next word that he gives is this. Be sympathetic. It literally means to suffer or feel what the other person is feeling. And as men, you know, we're really strong and bold and brave. And our culture has told us that if you, are, if you feel, you're a loser, right? I mean, that's basically what our culture says. But yet here's a clear Christian apostolic teaching that literally commands us to feel what the other person is feeling. And that applies to our marriages, And so as as hard as it may be, husbands, you've got to try to put yourself in the place of your wife, to be sympathetic towards her. And the same thing for, for the wives. Put yourself in that position, right? I mean, as terrible as it might sound to hear, I respect her, but I don't love her, think about those words and how that makes you feel. And then when you tell your husband, I love you, but I don't respect you, he feels the exact same way. It hurts. It's a violation of our honor code as a man. And so we need to sympathize with each other. We need to feel how the other person is feeling. Thirdly, he says this, I want you to love one another. As we talked about last week, there are three words for love. Agape love, phileo love, and eros love, erotic love. Agape is self-sacrifice, right? When the Bible says love your enemies, it's not saying walk up and give them a big hug, right? That's phileo love. That's brotherly love. That's what Christians have. Uh, agape love is the sacrifice for another person. But here in this passage of scripture, he uses the word phileo. It's where the Philadelphia is named after, the city of brotherly love. And so literally what he is saying is this, you guys are family. You're family. You need to treat each other like family, not just in the church for those of you who are Christians, but even in your, your marriages, your relationships. Think about that for a minute. I mean, sometimes, look, contention happens. Conflict comes up, and you can feel like the other person is your enemy. But the Bible was calling you to rise above your emotions and follow the plan that Jesus has laid out for you, and that is to treat another person like an intimate friend, somebody that you'd be willing to hug. Husbands, when you want to withdraw and stonewall, the last thing that you want to do is to hug and love your wife. But the Bible calls us to pursue her and do that. Wives, when you are so hurt, and you feel like the last thing you want to do is be kissed on and hold his hand and let him touch you and love you, and you're like, get away from me! (laughs) You know what I mean? I mean, come on, you know what I mean. You've got to overcome that feeling and come together and be unified because Satan wants to divide your marriage. He wants to divide you and put you at odds against each other, but the Bible says love each other. And then he goes on, number four, he says be compassionate. This literally means to be tender-hearted. It means to be merciful. It means to see the weakness of other people, see them in distress, and move with pity. Move to help them in their distress. And man, I'll tell you what, and I've done it, right? I'd be lying to you if I didn't. There have been times where I've been so harsh and mean with Angel that she has broken down and she's cried, right? Devastated, hurt emotionally wounded. And man, when I see her cry, I feel like the biggest jerk in the world. I feel terrible that I have been the cause of her pain, that I've driven her to that point that's devastated her so much to where she's weeping and she's crying and it doesn't feel good. And my heart moves with pity, but it shouldn't take her utter brokenness for me to get to that point. You with me? And so the Bible says that we need to be compassionate. One of the illustrations I like to give you, in the Old Testament, you had this guy named Jacob And um, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you've heard that phrase. So Jacob is the grandson of Abraham. And Jacob finds this really attractive lady, and her name is Leah. And he's like, she is hot. I've got to have her. And so he goes to her father, and he says, hey, look, man, what do you want for? I'll give you whatever you want. And her father Laban says, well, just work for me for seven years, and then you can marry her. And uh, most of us would be like, are you kidding me? That's ridiculous. I'm out of here, right? I'll go order one offline or something. (laughs) But he worked for her. I know, that was probably really bad. I shouldn't have said that. I'm sorry. Guys, please don't fire me. Don't fire me. 
So anyways, so he works for her for seven years, and he gets tricked, and he marries a, a, um, the, her sister. And, uh, or excuse me, Leah is, is the one that he didn't want, and he got her. And Rebecca is the one that he wanted. And so he, he went to Laban, and he said, hey, let me have Rebecca. And he says, work for me for seven years. And then he tricks, uh, he tricks him into marrying Leah. And Leah, her name was Weak Eyes, right? I mean, she was cross-eyed. Literally, like, that's what it means. She was cross-eyed. She was not a very attractive individual, according to what the Bible teaches. And so, not that looks should mean anything. I'm just telling you the story, okay? So, she's got weak eyes. He doesn't want her. He wants, his, he wants her sister. Well, he doesn't, he doesn't get Rebecca. And so, he has to, um, Rachel. Gosh, darn it. I'm actually paid to do this. Do you realize that? <laughs> Please don't fire me. I promise. I won't do it again. So, man, this is awful. So anyways, right, man, why do I keep saying Rebecca? Isn't that awful? Rachel. Gosh, the good looking one. Anyways, long story short, Rachel, he finally gets Rachel. Well, she can't give him children, and she's upset. She's wounded. She's hurt. And so she goes to him, and he says, she says, look, I can't give you a son. And he responds to her in Genesis like this, and it is so harsh and it's so mean, He says, am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of your womb? I mean, that is jacked up. In other words, God's cursed you. What am I supposed to do about it? Here she is hurting. She is broken. And it's in this moment that good old weak eyes, she says this. She says, surely now my husband will love me. Surely now my husband will love me. And it just shows the desperation of a wife. Here, uh, she's, she's crushed, she's wounded, she knows her husband doesn't want her. And she's like, wait, maybe now he'll want me. And so we've got to be compassionate towards each other. Especially, don't call your spouse by a name that they're not called. That would be horrible. Rebecca, man, I'll never live that one down. Gee, many frost. First Peter 3, he goes on to say this. He says, I want you to be humble towards each other. This, this means to, be low, to have lowliness of mind. It means not to think less of yourself, but to think of yourself less. It means to depend on the Lord for your reputation and your value, not to try to depend upon yourself. It's not about what I want. It's about what he wants. It's about what God wants. And so another way to look at this, and some of your translations might have this, is to be courteous. And that's what I have found in marriage, that when you lose your manners, you really start to take each other for granted. When you stop saying thank you and please and I appreciate you, when you stop building each other up and giving each other the basic courteous that you would give to a stranger on the street, conflict happens. We, we, we tear each other down. Peter said this, Do not repay evil for evil. And this reminds me of a passage in Matthew chapter 5 where Jesus is preaching. He's he's teaching to his disciples. And he says, um, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, do not resist an evil person. Bless them. Bless those who persecute you. Pray for those who are your enemies is what Jesus teaches us. And so if we're willing to do that for the world, we better be willing to do that in our relationships and in our marriage. Do not repay evil for evil. And man, in that moment, when you are hurt and you are heated, and the last thing that you want to do is to love or respect the other person, and you want to repay them back because you want them to feel the pain and the hurt that you feel. Well, the Bible says we, can't, we shouldn't do that. That's not how Christians are called to respond. He goes on to say this in this passage. He says, do not repay insult for insult. And this is a tough one. This is a tough one. But again, Jesus says in Luke chapter 6, verse 28, He says, don't repay an insult for an insult. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. So in that moment, husbands, when your wife starts to go on the verbal assault and every inch of your body wants to respond likewise, the Bible says that we are to bless them, to pray for them. That's what we're called to do. Same thing for the wives. Bless your husbands. Pray for him. And you know what? When I step out of line, angel at times, and it's the greatest thing that she can ever do, and it immediately puts me back in my place. She says, Rick, you're better than this. You are better than this. I love you. I appreciate you. You know that I value you, but you, you are better than this. You should not be acting this way. And a, a sense of shame comes over me, and I say, you know what? You're right. And that's something that we should do for each other, to see who we really are, our inner person, not just what we're being like in the flesh in that moment, and it is a tough thing to do. To see who the person is in the image, in the eyes of God. 
So we should be like-minded and sympathetic and love and compassionate and humble and not repay evil for evil or insult for insult. But he goes on to say finally to bless one another and that is to wish and pray for their welfare and to endeavor to pursue it. Look at Proverbs chapter 14 verse 1. It says, a wise woman builds her house but a foolish woman tears down it with her own hands. And so we cannot be our own worst enemy. We cannot hurt those tragically and horribly for those who we love the most. They're they're our family. And these are general Christian teachings for the church. But we're applying them this morning to a relationship with a husband and a wife. And so we need to identify the conflict and really think about it. Am I being unloving? Am I being disrespectful? We need to be committed to resolving it by following this passage of scripture in 1 Peter chapter 3. And we will receive the reward for resolving the conflict. He said it in verse 10 and 11. He says, you will be blessed. You will inherit a blessing. And so here's Peter's argument. God blesses us. Therefore, we should bless others. I mean, think about it. If God treated you the way that you treat your spouse, a lot of us would be in big time trouble because we can be merciless, we can be uncompassionate, we can lack forgiveness, we can treat each other horribly sometimes. And if we want God to treat us with compassion and grace and mercy and love, we better be committed to doing that very same thing. And that's what the Bible teaches to treat others the way that you want God to treat you. And Jesus told his disciples this, and it's a very hard hard teaching. With the measure you use, that same measurement will be used against you by God. And so if I want mercy, I should give mercy. If I want forgiveness, I I should give forgiveness. That's what it means to unconditionally respect and love our spouses. And I'm not saying it's easy. And there are times in marriage, and this is all throughout the Bible, and we don't have time to get into it this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, there was a big problem in the early church. You had believers marrying unbelievers, and unbelievers wanted to go. And Paul said, let them depart in peace. That's what Paul says, right? It's a very hard teaching, and we could do an expository sermon on that and get into it. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 19, he says, what man, uh, when man comes together, what God has joined together, let no man separate. And he says, God issued you and allowed you to have divorces for marital unfaithfulness because of the hardness of your heart. And God does permit divorce in certain scenarios and certain situations. There are times when spouses come together, there's conflict in the marriage, and Paul says, you should depart and you should give a time for prayer and for fasting, but don't let it last forever. Because Satan will get a foothold, and he will divide your marriage. And so there are some qualifiers, right, that we do find in the Bible that that teaches about uh, marriage between a man and a woman. And so I can only present to you in the time that I'm allotted some of these truthful principles that are sacred in the Scripture, and that I have found that have worked for me. And so if we want to be happy in our marriage, what will we do? We will seek peace. We will pursue it. And we will seek peace without bitterness. Bitter means to be rotten to the bone. It's a root that they had that you couldn't even stand the smell of, let alone eat. It would just turn you completely away. And so we cannot seek reconciliation and the reward of a happy marriage with a bitter heart. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. Blessed are those who are peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And then again in Romans chapter 12, verse 18. If it is as possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone including your husbands and your wives. And so in in that moment of conflict, when we are hurt, when we are angry, when we want to resort to our old ways that we inherited from our family, we've got to rise above that and follow God and follow his plan and be the person that God has created us to be. We must seek peace and pursue it. Because at the end of the day, it's not about winning an argument. It's not about being right and the other person wrong. It's not about being in control and the other person submits to you. But it's about winning God's heart with honor. And so who cares if you win the argument? Who cares if you beat your spouse down and you win? If you've lost the honor of God, what's the point? What's the point? And so we need to seek peace and pursue it.